Again, we are in North Carolina. A lot of people don't know that, even people at the NIH. So um, it's in Research Triangle Park, right next to Duke and UNC Chapel Hill. Um, it's a wonderful place for doing neuroscience research. And you know, we're, we're a really nice environment down there as well. We have a Triangle Synapse Club. So um, it's, it's a very nice place. I've been at the NIEHS for 22 years. Um, before I talk about my science, which I have the most fun doing, I was asked to talk a little bit about my uh, path, which, like others, is a bit meandering. I think, you know, you, you always are unsure exactly probably what you want to do. Most of you probably feel that. And I always say that you just find something, like everybody else said, that you really love to do. I still can't imagine that I'm doing studies on how the brain works. I didn't know that you can make a career doing that. And that was part of my meandering early on. So I grew up in Southern California, native on my mother's side, Luceno, from uh, reservations around Mount, pa around Mount Palomar. My father was a sheriff's deputy, so a police officer. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I thought science was interesting. I wanted to run track more than anything else. So I did community college for two years in California. They have a pretty good community college program. I was a hurdler sprinter for anybody that that's interested. And then um, when I was done, of course, you had to go somewhere. And I, I didn't know how to become a scientist because there weren't any in my family. My father and mother relocated to Central Oregon as the chief of police of a small town. And so I did my bachelor's degree at um, Oregon State University. And one of the best things I ever did, besides meeting my current wife there, was to take a graduate neurobiology class. The two things that really turned me on to neuroscience is some of you don't know what patch clamp recording is, but the techniques that we use now were basically invented in Göttingen, Germany. And in the late 70s, these papers were coming out. So for the very first time, we were reading papers in nature and science about electrophysiology, which is what I do. And most important, my light bulb moment was the first time I did a recording from a, 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 a plesia, a sea cucumber snail. The first time we put electrodes in, and I saw this thing called the action potential, then I was over. I knew that if I was going to succeed, I was going to do neurophysiology. I didn't know how to do it. I took a year off to goof around, make money, I thought. And then I realized I better get to graduate school. Uh, I was in UCLA near there. I don't know how I got in with the help of an affirmative action. We used to be able to say affirmative action. I know we really can't anymore. But uh, it's a diversity coordinator, Cleo White, which to this day, I wouldn't be where I am if it wasn't for her. She got me interesting to talk to different faculty. I loved neuroscience, didn't have the best grades, best GRE scores, but I was really passionate. So that's when it became clear that if I could get in and succeed. And so I got my PhD. I did two postdocs. Uh, the first was in Paris, France, which is another one of the best things I ever did. You can do science and live in Europe. And my second was at the Volum Institute in Portland, Oregon. And since 1993, I've been a PI, then a senior investigator, now head of the Department of Neurobiology at NIEHS. That's all in a nutshell. I hope that was clear. But the point is, is always find something you want to do and, and just work very hard doing it and never give up on the kind of things that interest you. As I always say, you know, we're going to work decades, so we better enjoy it or else it's going to be really long and really hard. And people that flip burgers have to work hard, so you might as well work hard doing science. That's what I always think. I, I really get disappointed when I hear people that don't want a faculty job because they think it's too hard or long hours and all that. But like I says, I, I want to know what isn't hard work. So. so there's my email address. I'd love to hear from any of you. Again, we're in North Carolina. So my um, passion is linking it to iodine channel. This is the nicotinic receptor channel. Um, hopefully none of you smoke or ever smoke. But if you did, the place where nicotine interacts in the brain is through this nicotinic receptor. So there's an extracellular ligand binding domain where the natural neurotransmitter is acetylcholine binds. Transmembrane domain and intracellular part. If you look at the top down, it's a pentamer. And ligand binds at the interface between two subunits. And it really opens and closes like a shutter on a camera, if you will. And when this channel opens, it's what we call excitatory. Positively charged cations flow into the cell. So this will be excitatory. There are nine different genes encoding nicotinic receptors in the mammalian brain. The area of the brain I'm most interested in is called hippocampus. Some of you may have heard about that. It's an important area for learning and memory, clearly not the only one, but an important area. So in the hippocampus, there are two main types of nicotinic receptors. We call alpha-7 
and I'll tell you a lot about that because that's where we spend most of our time. And a non-alpha-7, which is very diverse, the most likely combination is alpha-4, beta-2. This is the high nicotine affinity binding site. So this is where nicotine usually tackles. There are different properties, and I spent uh, seven, eight years of my, my lab just doing the biophysical properties of what these responses were. You know, if you, if you want to know how these channels affect the circuitry, you have to know all the nuts and bolts of the different proteins. And so we spent a lot of time doing that, different cell types. This is what, in the hippocampus, the C1 pyramidal cells look like. They're quite easy to see and, and do electrophysiological recordings from. One of the things I really want to highlight is because is I'm, I'm going to tell you the focus for about six to seven years now and for the rest of my career will be on the circuits, the flow of information in an area of the brain. Uh, which is a challenging to do, but we've never had better tools to be able to explore how the brain works. And the idea of synaptic plasticity, the modification of the communication and learning memory is very important. So the fact that these alpha-7 receptors are highly permeable to calcium, on the inside, it does a lot of interesting things that other uh, cations don't do. It binds to biochemical processes and uh, activates phosphorylation processes and, and such. So. The fact that this is highly calcium permeable will be really important later on. And please, if you have any questions all throughout, just raise your hand, let me know. I'd like to not lose someone along the way. So please, let's keep this very informal. So this is a synapse. Most of you probably know what a synapse is. At my institute, most people don't. So I spend a lot more time like, like you would teach uh, lower level folks. But here, I'm assuming a lot more of you know what a synapse is. So. These receptors are fast ligand-gated channels, and so you can imagine them as postsynaptic receptors mediating fast communication. It does that. But in addition, these receptors are also on presynaptic terminals, so they modulate the release of other neurotransmitters. And that will become very clear when we de delve into the hippocampal circuitry in more detail. There are other members that are very similar. My graduate work is actually on the serotonin-gated ion channel that's uh, almost identical to the nicotinic receptors. And so I've been studying these kinds of receptor proteins for a long, long time. Then the major inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain is GABA. And, and so the structures of these are very, very similar. So in my lab, I won't talk about it today, but we've done a lot of work on the structural side of it, of course. A lot of these receptors are involved in neurodegenerative diseases and disorders. And understanding how you can pharmacologically uh, alter their properties is important. And for that, you need structural information. Uh, you've seen this, the area of the brain. This, for those that know what the hippocampus is, it's a really clear infolding, if you will, of, of the cortex. Um, uh, you know, there are different areas I'll, I'll talk about. But the, the, the fact that there are links between dysfunction nicotinic receptors and in, 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 in Alzheimer's disease has been known for a long time. Also deficits in signaling in schizophrenia. The idea that schizophrenics chain smoke, I mean, really smoke a lot of cigarettes. The idea is that maybe they're self-medicating, trying to get nicotine higher up, activate nicotinic receptors that helps moderate some of the dysfunction in the circuitry. And then in dopamine uh, and in Parkinson's disease, I won't talk about that today, but there's some idea that nicotinic receptors, and this is common throughout the brain, may be neuroprotective. And uh, in collaboration with some faculty in my department, we're looking at the role on these dopamine-producing cells, the ones that die in Parkinson's, and how nicotine and nicotinic receptors may be neuroprotective. I mean, again, smoking is really bad for you, but there are some things in the way of Parkinson's, there's good evidence that it may be neuroprotective. So the idea is not to smoke, but if we could tickle those receptors in ways the other, other ways, through some pharmaceutical that we take, we may be able to help, uh, not cure necessarily Parkinson's, but delay some of the adverse side effects. So, um, The cholinergic inner neur the neurons from the, uh, from the medial septal and the diagonal band of Broca are the areas that we're most interested in because they innervate the hippocampus. And you'll see how we activate these to see how the native receptors function in, in the hippocampus. So starting about 2009, uh, I, again, I, I've, been, I've been obsessed by single channel recordings and, and, and all those other ways that we biophysically measure and, 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 and study the receptors in tissue. But it was clear that 
we could do this for all the different cell types, neurons and non-neurons alike in the hippocampus, and we still may not know how the whole circuit works. And so in this time, Bin 2 was in my lab back then. We used a voltage-sensitive dye. We incubated this slice with, with this dye, and we just slowly bath applied nicotine, thinking it was similar to the way the brain may be exposed with the hippocampus of nicotine, and asked, what do we see? Do we see uh, areas of increased excitability, hyperactivity, et cetera? So we got some surprises because, so here's this, this pseudo color. So the idea where you start to see yellow and green and up to orange and red is the area of the biggest excitability, if you will. So we saw, this is a pretty high concentration of nicotine, but if we went down to more physiological concentration, we also saw similar effects. We, here's, the, here's the cartoon, here's the hippocampus proper. So you have the dentate gyrus and the CA3 and the CA1 region. And this is the cortical region called the anorhinal cortex. So we have this larger slice in a chamber being cultured that, that we're studying here. And what's quite interesting is, 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 is while there's excitability throughout, there's this particular area which corresponds to the deep cortical layers and the subiculum. And that was a surprise because up until that time, no one is really studying the receptors in this area. So based on this, we thought, well, that may be an extremely important area. One thing I didn't tell you, but again, another beneficial side of nicotine is the fact that it enhances cognitive function. Again, that's not a good reason to smoke because it's also addictive. But the idea that in the hippocampus, the, the nicotinic receptor activation enhances cognitive function, and that's something that we're quite interested in. So we just want to do some pharmacology, and MLA is a methylcoconitine is a selective for the alpha-7 receptor. That antagonist did absolutely nothing. And the high-affinity nicotine receptors, alpha-4, beta-2, are blocked by dihydrobeta erythroidin, DH-beta-E. So you see there's a very potent effect, and this is just a control. So clearly we, we discovered that there was a really high density of these alpha-4, beta-2 type of receptors in the deep enterino cortical layers. Uh, this was an imaging uh, study, and being patch clampers, we could go in and record from individual neurons to make sure the signals we were seeing. That's something you always have to worry about in science, that you're doing studies, imaging, you're getting responses, you need to know whether they're true biological signals or not. And so we could record from each individual nerve cell throughout this and see that the data corresponded completely to our imaging studies. And again, the deep layer, layer six, had the highest a response amplitude. Then we just looked at some plasticity. So we recorded from these neurons and we stimulated the glutamatergic inputs to them with an extracellular recording electrode here. Very simple. And you get a really nice, fast, excitatory synaptic current. That's what they call these. I hope most of you know what those are. The idea that the glutamate is released by the presynaptic terminal, diffuses across the cleft, binds the receptors on the postsynaptic side. They're also excitatory, so you get a downward deflection and they're transient. And the amplitude of these EPSCs is very regulated. And so if you change their amplitude through some high excitability or through some peptide, long term, we call that long term potentiation or short term. It's generally people have different ideas of the timing, but LTP can be something that lasts tens of minutes to hours, days, or even weeks. And we think that LTP, long term potentiation, is a cellular model of learning and memory. So this is quite interesting. We stimulated the glutamatergic inputs. We bath applied nicotine. We got an enhanced function, which we expected. Then we could do this thing that people have been doing for, for decades, a little tetanus, a really high frequency, 100 hertz, 10 pulse. You get an increase, really brief, and it comes back down. And what was interesting to us is that if we combine these two, the, the tetanus with nicotine, we could induce LTP. So the point being that in the circuitry, it was modifiable. It doesn't prove that this is the area where nicotine enhances cognitive function, but it gives you a clue that they're there, they're important, they're regulating the circuit. Where you say LTP for this type of experiment, what is long? Where in my, our definition is greater than 40 minutes. When you do a patch clamp recording experiment, it's hard to have them last longer than 60 minutes. And so you try 60, and then your end go down. So we, we used 40. But people who originally discovered this in the 70s, they could do this for days or weeks or months. So I mean, we remember phone numbers from when we were like from decades ago or other things. And although I can't remember one from last year, but still, there are memories buried down in there. And we still don't know exactly how 
they're in there, but they're in there somewhere. So I know I'm going fast. I'm just trying to give a little bit of a flavor of the kind of things that we do in my lab. Uh, each one of these could be its own talk in and of itself. So we stopped there and we published that. But now Juhi Ham, uh, a postdoc in my lab, um, is looking at this much more detailed. So again, this is the C1 pyramidal cells. This is the major output of the hippocampus. Lots and lots of people have studied the CA1s, excitability in that. So she is looking at the output of the CA1 to the deep enterocortical layers again. And using current techniques, I'll talk about more optogenetics and transgenic mouse models. We can get in cholinergic neurons from septum. This is a cultured slice. And we can activate it with light for endogenous ACH release. And we can see a dramatic effect on the output of this. We can, by endogenous releasing acetylcholine, we can decrease the output by 50%. And we think one hint are these interneurons. They're called OLM, or Orion Lacanosa Moleculare. It doesn't really matter the details, but there's subclasses of interneurons in here that we believe are activated by acetylcholine. They inhibit the glutamatergic cells here, and you get a decrease in output. So these are the kinds of things that we're trying to look at. The alpha-7 receptors on these interneurons have been studied a long time, and so we're trying to put together this whole circuitry to look at where the modulatory points are for plasticity and such. So uh, this is one of the first major areas that we started to get into in my lab with plasticity and optogenetics, and so I wanted to take you through this. It's a few years old now, but we're still spending a lot of time trying to understand how it works. So, a lot of times you can put something in in an in vitro model and increase function or do something that looks like it's learning and memory, but it's not necessarily. Um, but we wanted to know how endogenous cholinergic signaling, a lot of times you can use pharmace pharmaceutical agents or agonists and antagonists and affect the circuitry. But Zinling was particularly interested in looking at the endogenous acetylcholine inputs and how they modulated plasticity. So here's the same hippocampal um, cartoon measuring the C1 output. The primary, not only, but the primary glutamate inputs come from the C3 or the Schaefer collaterals. So we just were stimulating the Schaefer collaterals, measuring the excitatory currents uh, in this circuitry. And his question is a lot of people study if you hyperstimulate these or you stimulate other pathways, what does it do to the amplitude of the synaptic response? But Zen Ling was particularly interested and how endogenous acetylcholine. As I told you from the septal nuclei, the acetylcholine comes through. Uh, and that's what this green area is here. Before we had optogenetics, which I'll tell you about, we, before we were able to use these, um, these algal light-sensitive proteins to stimulate cholinergic release, we used an extracellular recording electrode in the Orion's layer. And we asked if we released acetylcholine, could we affect the amplitude of the synaptic response here. And this is just a cartoon for what LTPO looks like. The amplitude is extremely high re highly regulated. It will go on for you know, hours and days and weeks without any change. But if you do something to induce LTP, then you'll see a, a dramatic increase of 60 to 70% that'll persist for tens of minutes to hours to days. And, and as I said, again, this is a cellular model of learning and memory. We think something like this is what actually occurs. And then there are downstream other effects, changes in gene regulation, expression, and such. So what Zen Ling had found is he, he varied. I won't take you through all this. This is just a highlight. He did an, an enormous amount of work. But the idea, if you vary the timing between when you released ACH and when you stimulated the Schaefer collaterals, at some points, this is the one that is the most important one. If you stimulate ACH release 100 milliseconds before, you can induce a very robust uh, LTP. At 50 milliseconds, nothing. And at other time points, nothing. If you actually stimulate ACH release after, at 10 milliseconds, you get another form of LTP. And you can also get short-term depression. So this is the one I want to focus on. ACH being released precisely 100 milliseconds before had a very strong effect on inducing LTP. We didn't know if it was a nicotinic receptor or another cholinergic receptor. It's a GPCR. It's a muscarinic receptor. So we just used our antagonist for the alpha-7 nicotinics, the non-alpha-7 nicotinics, and for muscarinics atropine. And what we found for this particular form of LTP 
is that it was completely blocked by the alpha-7 antagonist MLA. The other forms of plasticity had other pharmacological uh, sensitivities. I won't spend too much time on those. So what's very interesting is that we found a way that the endogenous release of ACH can stimulate the alpha-7 receptor and induce LTP. Up until now, we had done everything in rats, but because of the ability and the power of using transgenic mouse models, we switched over to mice, and what was lucky for us, in normal mice, we could induce the same form of LTP, and in the mouse where the alpha-7 receptor was knocked out, there was absolutely no LTP. So, the other thing, now these are in the spines. We did two photon imaging, so not only, so you have the, the cell body and you have the dendrites and the axon, in pyramidal cells, you also have thousands of spines. This is the sites at which the synapses actually occur. And these are very small, but you can actually do calcium imaging in the spines. And what we found out is that when we induce this LTP, we get a, normally you get a very, in, very fast increase in calcium when you activate the NMDA receptors. But if we induce this LTP with this stimulation, we can get a, not an increase in the amplitude of the calcium signal, but it lasted for hundreds of milliseconds longer. And this is one of the requirements for LTP is that the calcium goes up in these spines and there's some biochemical processes that are induced that results in insertion of glutamine receptors into the spines. And that's, in, in a sense, how you get this LTP. At this point, we were convinced that the alpha-7 receptor was involved and there was native uh, acetylcholine release, but we weren't convinced yet so we used, which is now becoming more and more common, I know a lot of people here at NINDS and other people at the NIH labs use optogenetics. And so uh, I don't want to take too much time on it. But in a sense, what you have is this, this channel rhodopsin channel, which is, which is from algae. And it has an opsin portion, so it's light sensitive, a blue light will activate it. And it's on a channel in the membrane, and it passes cations. And the way that the gradients in neurons are set up a cationic channel will excite that cell. So what you do now is, the idea is to put this protein into cholinergic neurons and only cholinergic neurons. So then when we use blue light now, you'll excite the cholinergic neurons and only the cholinergic neurons and, and see if, if the same thing we saw with electrical stimulation could be induced. And this is a construct, we, we, this is the first paper, uh, Basically, we're putting in the channel rhodopsin and a marker, M cherry, uh, in that case, so we could see the cells, the cholinergic cells that have been infected with this virus encoding channel rhodopsin and M cherry. So these are put in only cholinergic neurons. We're using this chat Cree mouse. So the enzyme that results in the synthesis of acetylcholine is choline acetyltransferase. So someone else made a mouse where they used a Cree recombinase in these cholinergic neurons. And so when you infect with this, uh, this virus, it'll basically infect all cells, but only in the cholinergic neurons will the Cree recombinase attack and will you get expressed the channel rhodopsin and M-cherry. So this just shows you that this is in the septum where we inject the uh, virus. And you can see all the red cells are the cells that are infected because that's the M-cherry protein that's being expressed. And to confirm that all the red cells are also cholinergic, we just in a, we use an antibody to chat. And you can see here that um, we're infecting about half of the cholinergic neurons. But every, the confirmation is that every neuron that was infected was a cholinergic neuron. So you can see now here that, that all of these red are the axonal processes from the septum that have innervated, re -innervated the hippocampus after we injected virus into these chat Cree mice. Then to confirm that it was actually working, now we use blue light, and you can induce ACH release and get a synaptic response here. And so we redid all of our experiments before, and now, instead of with an extracellular electrode, we're only using blue light and only releasing ACH. If we release ACH 100 milliseconds before, we stimulate the glutamatergic safer collaterals we also could induce LTP, uh, and it's blocked by MLA. So we basically have proven, and that's why this was published in Neuron, that um, now acetylcholine and cholinergic inputs from the septum in the right precise time can release ACH, activate alpha-7 receptor, and induce LTP. 
Um, we're using other tools we publish in Jane Neuroscience the next year where we're looking at where the alpha-7 receptors are precisely. And so we use now a co-culture system where we can actually use a slice of the septum and a slice of the hippocampus, and we can actually watch the regrowth of cholinergic fibers into the hippocampus here. And the advantage of this system now is it's very controlled. And nowadays, we're using viruses for everything. We're infecting viruses in the cholinergic neurons. We can infect viruses to put in calcium-sensitive dyes. So one that we've been using is called G-CAMP. So this was engineered. It has a GFP part, so it's green. And you put in a, an M13 in the calmodulin part. So the point is, is that the fluorescence of G-CAMP will go up dramatically when calcium increase goes up intracellularly. So now, instead of using electrophysiology, which is a passion of mine, the problem with electrophysiology is, in a sense, you're only recording one cell at a time. Now you can put in these indicators in whole groups of cells, non-neuronal cells, neuronal cells, and now you can just do imaging experiment. And for example, this is an area in the CA1. You can look at the axons of the, of the CA3 neurons only, because only the CA3 neurons have been infected with G-CAMP or in the postsynaptic cells in the dendrites, and you can start to look at whether these modulatory processes are, are inhibitory or excitatory, and whether they're pre- or postsynaptic. And so that's what, in a sense, that we've been trying to do, is to look at how the release of ACH is regulating plasticity in the hippocampal circuits. And the confusing part is that the mechanisms of the receptors are on the presynaptic side, on the postsynaptic side, and also non-neuronal cells, and it's really challenging because every area of the hippocampus we look, it seems like the rules are a little bit different. Um, a couple other things that we're doing in my lab. So LTP is one aspect of excitability that directly measures the output of the CA1 glutamatergic neurons. My first love really in the hippocampus was on these GABAergic interneurons. We were the first lab that showed in the late 90s that the interneurons had nicotinic receptors. They express far more nicotinic receptors than pyramidal cells. And basically, the C1 pyramidal neurons don't do anything unless the interneurons allow them to. So we wanted to get back a little bit to the interneuronal networks. And so a lot of people here, again, are studying these different brain waves. But one of them is, is a theta. And it, is, it seems clear that theta is interesting, particularly when animals are going and exploring, going through mazes when they're learning tasks, particularly when there's a spatial component to it, you will get this 5 to 10 hertz oscillation, and the whole brain can be measured, but in particular in the hippocampus. And so for decades now, we've known about theta, but one of the important points is how is it regulated? We really don't know. And in vitro models of, of hippocampal slices, it's been quite challenging to develop a model system where using endogenous ACH, you can induce theta. And Zen Lingu in my lab, he took him two or three years to do it, but this is just a demonstration. I'm not showing you anything else other than this one slide. But the idea is that now, when he combines the cortical area and hippocampus and the septum, we can use light to induce ACH release. And if we pair that with Schaefer collateral stimulation, we can induce really nice theta rhythm through the endogenous release of ACH. So we've been really excited by this. And so we're trying to understand the mechanism by which theta is, 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 is started and how it's regulated. And we can combine this with actually doing in vivo recordings in, in animals going through mazes and to, to measure it too. And so that's the kind of things that we're starting to do in my lab. And one last little story I also want to tell you about a presynaptic regulatory mechanism. So everything, almost everything I've been telling you about is a C1 pyramidal layer here. But in particular for schizophrenia, it's been quite clear that the mossy fiber terminals, so these are the granule cells that are glutamatergic that innervate the CA3 in these mossy fibers. They're large bouton, and there's something going on there that if, if there's too few alpha-7 or if there's dysregulation, the thought is that there's abhorrent excitability. And this is one idea that schizophrenics smoke to a high level because they have to get the nicotine high enough to tickle the alpha-7 receptors. So Ching finally uh, tackled this. People in my lab have tried for a while. But so the idea is to look at the presynaptic regulation of glutamate release on the mossy fiber terminals 
and how alpha-7 receptors are involved. And again, we think it could be in some way explaining the abnormal circuitry that's, that's going on in people with schizophrenia. So she published this in J Neuroscience last year that if you activate the nicotinic receptors on these mossy fiber terminals, you can increase glutamate release through a mechanism involving PKA. So most of what I'm in my lab are doing is the extracellular side, but in this case, we're looking at this intracellular signal transduction cascades that may be shown. And her hypothesis was that the adenyl cyclase 1 may be involved. So this is what I'm telling you about here. And we continue to use GCAMP. This is a calcium-dependent uh, fluorescent protein, and so we can put GCAMP into the presynaptic terminals now. They're so small, it's very difficult to record for them electrophysiologically. So in this case, if we put in a calcium molecule that will measure the release and, and demonstrate when calcium increases, so we put in GCAMP in the mossy fiber terminals, and then now we're going to use another uh, FRET-based molecule called EPAC, and this is a molecule that will measure the basic level of psychic AMP in the presynaptic terminals. And it does this by a process called FRET or Forster Resonance Energy Transfer. And basically, you have two fluorophores, and there's a donor and an acceptor. And if these two fluorophores, they'll each fluoresce, and if the two fluorophores get close enough together, I didn't put these in the right order. What will happen is that the emission from one will be accepted by the other, and you'll get a change in the output of the fluorescence. And so that's, in a sense, what we're doing. In the absence of psychic AMP, this is the basic configuration of, of the molecule EPAC, and it will mostly fluoresce in the yellow range. And if it, psychic AMP goes up, there will be a conformational change. These two fluorophores will be separated, and you will mostly emit blue. And so we go in through do this, and these are the mossy fiber terminals, and we can see that there's a decrease in the ratio, which corresponds to an increase in psychic AMP. And forsklin is, a, is, a, is an adenylase cyclase activator. And so then we go and we activate alpha-7 receptors, and we can show the same thing, that we get an increase in psychic AMP. This is the first time it's ever been shown that this um, alpha-7 receptor can lead through uh, psychic AMP increase. And Adenocyclase 1 is an interesting adenocyclase. This, this, convert, this makes uh, psychic AMP. It's a calcium-dependent cyclase. So, the, so Ching thought that maybe AC1, which is actually very um, prevalent in mossy fiber terminals, and again, dysfunctions in schizophrenia are often linked with different expression levels of AC1. So that also fits in uh, a bit with that story. So she hypothesized that particularly AC1 may be what's the culprit because it's an adenylate cyclase, but it's also calcium dependent. And it could be that the calcium coming through the alpha-7 receptor is activating AC1. So we use siRNA, small interfering RNAs, and this is just an antibody. It's, it's difficult with siRNAs to have a complete reduction, and we only got about a 40% reduction, but basically we went with that. So we thought if we can decrease the amount of adenocyclase 1 in our preparation by 40%, what effect might that have on the alpha-7 signal? And you can see here now that the ability of alpha-7 to activate psychic AMP has decreased about 70%. So uh, this and another pharmacological agent that is specific for AC1 has convinced us that in the mossy fiber terminals, activating alpha-7 receptors, while it will depolarize the terminal, it will also bring in calcium and because there's a lot of AC1 in these mossy fiber terminals, it will lead to the phosphorylation of PKA, and now we know uh, uh, other downstream signaling events. And so we're quite interested in, in how this, which leads to glutamate release, regulates the excitability of this circuit. So that was a couple things that are going on in my lab. I just wanted to give you other flavors that are going on. We're starting to do a lot more behavior. We're novices at this. We hadn't done it much. If you want these days to really have high-impact papers in neuron, nature neuroscience, and that, it seems like you have to go all the way from biochemical, cellular, all the way to behavior these days. And so these papers take an inordinate long time. So patience is a virtue, obviously. So, but we're trying to do that. Because the idea you can do some of these recordings on live animals going through mazes, to look at not only 
record the signals coming from groups of neurons, but now with these optogenetic techniques, you can also go in and activate certain circuits and see how that affects behavior or inhibit certain circuits. Uh, stem cells, a lot of people are quite interested. I never thought I'd be doing something interesting in stem cells, but in the olfactory system, in the, in the subventricular zone and in the hippocampus, in humans, we have proliferative neurons. It's, it's, it's been controversial, but it's quite clear now that we have areas where new neurons are being born in our brains. And Che Kuo is at Duke University. He came to my lab to study nicotinic receptors in the olfactory system, and he had a wonderful paper last year in Nature Neuroscience. It seemed like that acetylcholine through nicotinic receptors is affecting proliferation of these neural stem cells, and so we started to investigate this in the, in the, in the subgranular zone. And then we have really interesting preliminary findings that, that there may be a change in the proliferation of these neural precursor cells in the hippocampus, and that could be really exciting because you could imagine in certain diseases like Alzheimer's where there's a decrease in the numbers of brain cells, if there are mechanisms to populate more in, that would be quite interesting. And then in Alzheimer's, the cholinergic neurons from the septum are known to die, and very few people actually study these neurons directly, and Joanne in my lab has been studying those, their properties, their regulations, et cetera. And again, I just want to thank the current members of my lab that I, I talked about today, and my lab manager, technician, and everything, Patty. And we couldn't do without a lot of viral work. We have a viral vector core that I manage, and an imaging core, because nearly everything we do these days uses viruses and imaging, including electrophysiology. And I went fast, and I apologize for that, but I'd be more than happy to take questions as time will allow. And thank you for your attention. Well, I'm hoping you have a, I know you're having a great day, you're getting a lot of great advice. Uh, always ask for help, always ask for advice, never give up, and, 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 and you know, it, 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 it's, it, it, that's what it takes, is never giving up and stay in science, stay in neuroscience if that's what you're interested in. And there are great careers out there. Question. Yes. No, they will. So that's one of the problems. Hyperactivation of alpha-7 receptors is excitotoxic. Absolutely. So that's one of the issues. In neurons, I didn't talk much about that, but we're studying non-neuronal cells a lot. And one of our hypotheses is, is that the neuroprotection is the alpha-7 receptors on astrocytes. There, there are alpha-7 receptors. There are many fewer. And so you would have more difficulty, you know, killing those. But neurons, for example, you can increase the amplitude of alpha-7 or decrease desensitization, you're hyperstimulating them, that's really bad for neurons. And so that's one of the things that we're working on in our own lab is the idea of neuroprotection. There's a fine balance between good, happy, and bad, happy, you know. So it's, it's, it's a very sensitive area. So these drugs that, are, that enhance function of alpha-7, they have to maintain the kinetics. We call these allosteric modulators. So they basically increase the amplitude but maintain the kinetics because if you, if you bring in too much current and too much calcium, that's going to be really bad. So that's a, that's a great observation you had on there. So that's, that's a fine balance of the neural. The neural, the synapses are so finely tuned, that's always the problem, is how do you modify them enough for good without having the downside? And that's just, the, the balance is so fine there, the fine tuning. And so that's one of the tricks of, the, of, of brain circuitry is, is how do you, tweak it to enhance its function without the downside. You know, you, you can't necessarily have everything. That's, that's a really great observation. I know I'm not sitting around long, but if any of you want to write me for whatever reason, just please do. You have my email address. I reply quickly to emails. And again, thank you for your time.